Okay, so um, one of the few disadvantages of being an international supervillain is that I, I kind of li live uh, in a black hole of communication. I, I have literally no cell coverage where I live and I'm at the end of a four kilometre long DSL line. So my, my upload speed is about um, 800 kilobits per second, which is not really enough. I, I don't know what you're seeing in why the video, but if I do this, it's probably not gonna look real good. Um, so what we decided was that I would pre-record the actual talk that I wanna give so that you would actually be able to see it. And we're, we're broadcasting it from uh, Todd's uh, bat cave, which has much better connectivity than mine. So uh, uh, without further ado, we won't waste any more time. Uh, I'll get uh, Todd to, to run the video and then I will be back live uh, after the, the presentation uh, to take any questions that you might have. Good day. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a simple matter of programming. But of course, that comes with the usual caveat. And the project that I'm going to discuss today originates from a consideration of the three Pearl Virtues, which as most of you will know, are laziness, impatience, and hubris. So laziness is the idea that things are very often more difficult than we really want them to be. Why couldn't this thing that I want to do be easier? And that naturally leads to a kind of impatience, because if I want it to be easier, I really want it to be easier right now. And unless there happens to be something on CPAN that makes that easier, then in the Perl universe, that further leads to hubris. And hubris is the idea of, well, no one else has done this, but how hard could it really be? Maybe I could do this instead. And the problem with that last question is that the answer is often very, except when it's very, very, very. But what I want to talk to you about today is not just motivated by those three virtues, because there's a fourth virtue, or rather, a zeroth virtue. And I think the zeroth virtue is something that very frequently motivates me to pursue the other three to create new tools and new techniques for Perl. And that zeroth virtue is the virtue of envy. So frequently, I'll look at another language and I'll say, wow, they have some really wonderful toys. They have some amazing features, some amazing tools built into the language. And whether that language is Haskell or Julia or Raku, the problem is it's not Perl. And I don't have those features available to me directly in Perl. And that makes me sad because it means that I have to write whatever I'm going to write in Perl in a way that's harder than it needs to be. And that's slower to develop than it needs to be and maybe slower to execute as well. And ultimately, maybe it's also uglier than it could be otherwise. But it's not just envy of other programming languages that drives some of the projects that I've been working on recently. There's also another kind of envy, and that is the envy of the development environment in which people get to use these languages. And it might be that I look at environments like VS Code or Eclipse or Comma, and I say, well, they have features that I don't have in my development environment, which is Vim. And that makes me even more unhappy. Because not only am I writing things the hard, slow, ugly way, but I also have to code them using a hard, slow, ugly environment. So what I want to talk to you about today is a story of applying those Perl virtues. How envy leads on to laziness, which leads on to impatience, which then gets completely overwhelmed by my own hubris. And the story that I want to tell you starts with this guy. <laughs> 
For those of you who don't know who this is, this is Curtis Poe, better known as Ovid. Except in this story, he's not this particular meme, he's the other meme. He's sad Ovid. And the reason he's sad is that he's reporting a bug in a Vim plugin that I built for people who want to use Vim to edit Perl. And that plugin is called Track Perl Vars. And what Track Perl Vars does is this. It allows you, as you move around your Perl code, and you put the cursor over any kind of variable, to see everywhere in the code where that variable's being used. And even if that variable is actually spelt a little differently, for example, with a different sigil because of the way Perl's syntax works, this plugin allows you to see where that is being used. And the same for hashes. And the problem with this plugin is that it doesn't actually work very well for scalars. Now, you're saying, well, it's highlighting all of those scalars. Yeah, but they aren't all the same scalar. For example, this scalar is completely separate. It's the parameter of a subroutine. And this scalar is completely separate. It's the iterator of a for loop. And this one is explicitly declared to be a different scalar. And yet, whenever I put the cursor on any of those, all of them get highlighted. So that's painful to me because it's not actually doing the job that I built that plugin to do. It's not actually helping me understand my Perl code visually. So it's painful that the plugin doesn't understand Perl scoping rules, but it's not terribly surprising because, in fact, most humans don't understand Perl scoping rules either. If we look at a simplified version of the code that I just showed you, and we look at the various declarations that are going on here, we get a sense of just how weird Perl's scoping rules actually are. So when this variable is declared, then it goes into scope. And the scope in which it exists is from the point where it's declared to the end of the surrounding block except that it's not declared until the end of the statement in which it's declared. So you get this kind of gap in the scope immediately after the declaration. And the same thing happens in a for loop. When I declare the iterator variable of a for loop, its scope only starts inside the block. So once again, there's this little gap where the previous scope is still in effect. And the same thing if I declared a variable inside an if statement, which I can certainly do in Perl. And once again, it only becomes active in the block of the actual if statement. And so we end up with these little indentations in the scope in the two-dimensional sense, which makes it really hard to write code that understands how the scope works because any tool that is going to try and understand this is not seeing this code as a two-dimensional structure, but simply as a one-dimensional string of characters representing the source code. So if we turn that into a one-dimensional structure, it looks something like this. And you can start to see just how weird the scoping actually is. We seem to go in and out and back in and back out of the scope. It's almost like it's this random type of Morse code effect. And I think if it were Morse code, it would be basically telling me there is no way you can teach Vim how to understand this. So the fact that the Vim plugin doesn't understand the Perl scoping rules is probably understandable. And it's also in very good company. There are plenty of other tools that people use for editing Vim that don't really understand the scope of Vim variables either. For example, if we looked at the same code in Eclipse and we selected 
a variable, then we discover it thinks they're all the same variable, except for some reason it thinks that this particular instance of it, the parameter of the subroutine, is not the same variable. In fact, I suspect it's not understanding that it's a variable at all. And things are no better if we look at Visual Studio. So once again, if I select the variable, it just selects all of them. It really doesn't understand the differences. And it doesn't understand that this example here isn't in fact the same variable at all. And so that's very frustrating. Now, when I'm coding in Rakuto, I have a very much better time of things. For a start, because Rakuto's idea of scope is a little bit simpler. So here's that code in Perl, and here's the equivalent code in Raku. And in Raku, as soon as I declare a variable, that variable is in scope and in scope until the end of its block. And as soon as I declare the parameter of a pointy block or of a subroutine, then that variable is in scope to the end of the associated block that it's a parameter of. And the same thing occurs if you're doing it in an if statement because the syntax is uniform in those cases as well. So if I flatten this out into a linear sequence, then I can see that it's very much simpler, that you have this simple progression into and out of scopes, which is easy enough to track with a simple stack. The other reason that Rakutas have a better time is because they have an IDE that actually understands their language. So the comma IDE, when I highlight a variable, actually understands the scope of that variable and is therefore able to highlight and show me only those instances of the variable which belong in that scope. And that makes it very much clearer to me what's going on and what I'm going to do. And more importantly than just that, all of the tools that Comma provides to you in terms of refactoring work in exactly the same way. So for example, if I decided that data is not a great name for a variable, and I said, look, I'd like to rename that variable, then it immediately knows all of the ones that it wants to rename. And as soon as I start renaming it to information, it renames all of them consistently. And that's very, very handy. In addition to that, people using Raku in comma get all sorts of other lovely toys. For example, You'll notice that there are multiple instances where I'm calling the char method on this data variable. And I might like to optimize this by just calling that once and throwing it into a variable. So I can do that very easily. I can say, look, I'd like to extract this to a variable. And it immediately tells me, look, you've got two instances of this. And you say to me, well, hang on a minute. There's more than two instances there. I can see four or five of the instances there. However, those two instances are the only two that are actually using that variable. The other instances are using other variables that happen to be the same name. So if I select both of those, then it's going to just allow me to change the name of this like so. And what it's done is it's replaced the two instances there with a variable which it's initializing to that particular value. And that's pretty cool. And of course, if I did that in an outer scope with exactly the same thing, then again, it finds two instances, but there are different two instances. So it does the right thing based on the scoping that it finds. But of course, you can't always just refactor something out into a variable. If I tried to refactor that out into the variable, it would say the thing once, but then it wouldn't say it every time that I access the variable. 
So comma will also allow you to extract something out into a subroutine at whatever scope is appropriate. And we'll do something like this. It will create a local subroutine which simply does the operation and then you could go to any other place and install data length there as well. Or, more interestingly, you could say, I want to factor that out into a subroutine, but I want to actually pass the parameter in separately. I don't want to use it as like a closure over the parameter. I want to simply do that. And now the subroutine that you get has an argument and that argument is passed in. And then I could use that same thing in all of the places where I say data chars, and I could just say data length, whatever. So comma is great if you're using Raku, which I do about half the time. But when I'm using Perl, I still have to use Vim. And not just because comma doesn't really handle Perl very well, but more because I've been using Vim for about four decades now, and I'm just a lot stupider when I'm not using it. So I have this envy. My chosen environment of Vim doesn't have all the cool toys and all the built-in syntactic knowledge that another environment has. And I want it to do so. I want my experience of coding in Vim to be as easy as my experience of coding in Comma. And I want that absolutely now. So from those three initial virtues comes a vast amount of hubris. How hard could it be to teach Perl's entire syntax to Vim? And how hard could it be to also teach Vim all those lovely IDE features that I find in Comma? And so that's what I did. I taught Vim how to understand the scoping of Perl variables. So as I move around, you see it only highlights the variables in their own scope. And it understands the difference between arrays and hashes, and it knows the scope of each particular variable. And that then becomes vastly more useful to me because it helps me understand when I'm making mistakes about variables and their scoping. But I wanted this environment to be able to do a lot more than that. For a start, it would be great if I could get some kind of visual indication of what the actual scope of these variables is. So in other environments, you often have things they call scope bars, where when you highlight a variable, it shows you exactly where that variable is valid. So I wanted that also in Vim. And I can have that. All I have to do is set up an appropriate highlighting group for scope bars. And whenever I am on a variable, it shows me the scope. And the scopes are color coded so that small scope variables get a nice cool blue color and variables with Scopes that are getting kind of too large get color coded in red. And the other thing I did was to solve the problem that Ovid was reporting with the Track Perl Vars plugin. And that is when I do detect a variable like this, I would like to also be able to see other variables of similar names that are not that variable. At the moment, I don't see them because 
They're not highlighted, but I would like them to be highlighted in such a way that says these are not the same. So what I want to do here is I want to be able to detect and highlight what I'm going to call homograms, and that is variable names that are spelt the same but mean something different. So I added another highlighting group, homograms, and if you set that to something interesting, then every time you highlight a variable, all the other variables in the same scope, which have the same name, get highlighted in that alternative highlighting. So you can see variables that you might confuse with the variables that you're using. And hopefully that encourages you not to call every single variable data. And of course, once I have the idea of being able to analyze the whole code and find other kinds of problems, then there are all sorts of problems that I'd like this also to be detecting for me. For example, Many years ago, a good friend of mine told me a horror story about developing software for fly-by-wire systems for aircraft, where they had a persistent bug that was causing their virtual simulations to crash repeatedly, and it all came down eventually to the fact that they had two variables, one of which was called attitude, and the other of which was called altitude. And those two variables were being used in the same scope and people's brains were just not picking that they were not the same variable. So I thought to myself, there are lots of cases where that happens, especially if your team is half based in the US and half based in Britain, for example. So I thought, why couldn't this environment also highlight variable names that were likely to be confused? For example, if I have a variable called attitude, then any variable called altitude is likely to be confusing. So I'd like that to be highlighted for me as this is not the same thing. Likewise, where there are regional differences in spelling, I would like those differences in spelling to also be highlighted for me so that I can easily pick up the kind of bugs that can be very hard to track down otherwise. Now, interestingly, I want it to be reasonably smart. So I want it to be able to tell me, look, you've got altitude and attitude here, but you've also got a variable called aptitude. And you'll notice that it's not in fact highlighting aptitude. So this is not just about the number of characters of difference between the two variables. It's about psychologically, are you likely to confuse these two? And for reasons of the structure of the letters of those three words, altitude and attitude are likely to be mistaken for each other, but aptitude probably not so much. The other thing that I decided was, if you've got two separate variables that are very similar, but are in completely different scopes, then there's no need to highlight the likely confusion because the compiler is not going to allow you to put the wrong variable in the wrong scope. On the other hand, if they're actually in the same scope, then we do want to highlight the potential for confusion there. Yet another kind of analysis that I wanted my environment to be able to do was to detect when people were basically choosing poor names for variables. So this is the problem that I encounter quite often when I'm teaching program and particularly software development techniques. And that is when people write code, they choose names like record or item count or data set which tell me absolutely nothing about what this variable's for, what it's doing, how it's contributing to the overall algorithm. They're just bad generic kinds of names. So I thought it would be really cool if my environment could pick me up when I was using these kinds of bad generic names. <laughs> 
So I arrange yet another kind of analysis, which again is optional, where you can set a highlight group for cacograms. And cacograms is a made up word meaning crappy names. And so if I set some kind of highlighting specifically for that, then we see all of the really poor names in this example get highlighted. And of course, if we're highlighting those really poor names, we're hoping that someone will go in and change them. But of course, it's frustrating to want to go in and change this thing and then have to change it all through the code. So this brings us on to the idea of adding these standard IDE features into Vim as well. So I'd like, for example, to be able to rename this variable everywhere in its own scope. So naturally, that's exactly what I added. Whenever you have the cursor over a variable, you can just say rename that variable and give it a new name. Uh, let's try and find a client info. And then it will rename it everywhere. And even though it's a hash with a percentage sign, it will also detect the usage of that hash, which we might have a dollar sign or an at sign instead, and correctly change that. And if we step off that now, we'll see that it's no longer a cacogram because it's presumably specific enough for us to understand what's going on here. And so we could do the same thing with item count or in particular data set. Data set's just a terrible name. So I could say, well, instead of data set, then it's going to be client records. And it will change that. And again, it's no longer a cacogram. So once we've started on the idea of adding these IDE features to Vim, it's very hard to stop. So I wanted to be able to do all that clever refactoring stuff that I showed you a little bit earlier in Comma. For example, if I go down here and I ha have the length of some kind of data, I'd like to be able to hoist that out into a variable. And I'd like it to be able to say, OK, I found all of these instances. Now you'll notice that there are in fact Three, uh, three or four more instances of length of data, but it hasn't selected those because the data variable inside those expressions isn't the same variable. So you can't hoist them out into the same variable. You'll notice also that it's tried to make up a name for it based on what it's found in the source code. I might prefer to have data len like I was using before, and then it does this. It puts a lexical variable in there which is initialized with the value of the expression, and then it replaces the expression everywhere where that variable is correctly in scope. And of course, if I tried to do the same thing down here, then we see that it hoists it right up to the top of its scope, replaces everything in the same scope, but still leaves these other instances of length of data alone. Now, hoisting out into a variable is cool, but it's not always the right solution. And it's not the right solution in the case where we want to do something like this. If I refactor this out into a variable, then the problem is it's going to do that say only once when it initializes the variable, and then just putting the variable into the code is not going to make it say that every time. So hoisting to a variable is not always the right solution. What we really want to be able to do is to hoist this to some kind of subroutine. And the easiest way of doing this and the cleanest way of doing this in modern Perl would be to say, I'd like to hoist this out into a little closure. And what I'd like to do is I'd like it to insert a very small lexically scoped subroutine that does that piece of code. Now, of course, that variable is just the same variable there because this is a lexical subroutine, so it can be a closure over that variable. And now the two calls to say length data do exactly the right thing. 
And you'll notice that all of the other potential calls haven't been changed because once again, it knows the scope of the variables that are involved in the operation that it's refactoring, and it knows when to leave things alone. So that's fairly cool. But you might say to me, yeah, but the problem is that only works in later versions of Perl. If I'm actually using a really early version of Perl still, and there are people that have to do that, then I've got a problem. So if I want to refactor that into a lexical subroutine, that's not going to work because Perl 514 didn't have lexical subroutines. Well, once again, the module is smart enough to know that and to do the right thing. So if I say that I want to hoist those out, you'll see now what it does is something a little bit different. It creates an anonymous subroutine that can act as a closure over that variable, and then it just assigns it to another lexical variable. And then when I want to call it, it uses the variable and does a dereferenced subroutine call through that. But sometimes even a closure isn't the right thing to do, because we've got a lot of places where we say length of data, and it's not always the same data. So what we'd also like to be able to do is to say, well, OK, find every instance of that and turn it into a subroutine that can replace all of these say length of data. And of course, to do that, we're going to have to pass the data variable into the subroutine as an argument, because it's going to be a different variable in different scopes. So I can say, I want to refactor that out to something, let's call it data length, and it does this. So every instance of say data there has been replaced with a call to some function called data length, passing in the argument as a parameter. And then we can simply install that subroutine wherever we find it appropriate. And this technique is fairly smart because it understands the scoping of different variables. So for example, if I said I'd like to refactor this entire thing into a subroutine, then now it knows that it needs to pass the array and the hash version of data into the subroutine. And indeed, it installs those and changes every use of those inside the subroutine. But things can get trickier than that. For a start, suppose that I wanted to refactor this whole component into a single subroutine call. Well, that's a little bit tricky because if I refactor out the declaration of the variable, then the code immediately afterwards that uses that variable isn't going to work correctly anymore. So the module's smart enough to understand that because it understands scoping. And what it does instead is it declares that variable as one of the arguments to the subroutine so that it's still available in the outer scope. And what does the subroutine actually look like? It now passes in a third reference here, which it can simply use to assign in the normal way. On the other hand, if I wanted to refactor the entire assignment and every use of the variable that's being declared there. Then it doesn't bother with hoisting the variable back out into the argument list because it's detected that the variable is only used 
in this scope. And therefore, it doesn't need to pass it in or pass it back out either. Finally, it has good understanding of the actual structure of Perl, so that if you try and get it to refactor something that isn't valid code, it just says, no, can't do it, doesn't make any sense. The module's called CodeArt. It stands for Analysis, Refactoring and Tracking. And yes, I did consider calling it TAR or RAT instead, but I think art's kind of more hopeful. And the point here is, this is not just for Vim. I tried to write it in such a way that it would be easy to plug in to any kind of scriptable editor. You simply write a few small pieces of Perl and get those called remotely from within the editor and possibly asynchronously. And then those small pieces of Perl just read in the contents of the buffer from standard in, do the processing necessary, take the data structure that is produced, convert it to a native data structure and print it to standard out, and then the editor reads that back in and does whatever it likes with it. And that's exactly what I did for Vim. I wrote a small module, CodeArt API Vim, that reads in the buffer contents from standard in, then calls the appropriate subroutine from the main code art module, and then converts the resulting hash into a Vim script dictionary and prints that out. And then for all of the other facilities that the code art module provides, there are pretty much identical functions that do the same sort of thing. And then back in the editor, I wrote a very small amount of script to hook that into the editor itself. So I find the position that I am in the buffer. I work out what do I want to do here? Well, I want to classify the variable that's under the cursor at the moment. So then I make a small Perl call saying, load the module, execute the request, pass in as standard input the entire contents of the buffer, and then the system command in VimScript actually returns the output of that command, which I then evaluate as a regular VimScript dictionary. And once I have that information, then I can do whatever I want to do with that information. Or in many cases in the Vim version of this, I'm going to do it asynchronously instead. So I start an asynchronous job, call exactly the same Perl function, passing it the buffer as that standard in and saying, and when you get standard out back, call this handler function. And the handler function just evaluates what it gets back and does something with it. So you're probably wondering, well, how does the module itself work? And the answer, not very surprisingly, is via a giant regular expression that I wrote. And if we pull back and have a look at that regular expression, we'll see that it, in fact it's nearly 350 lines long. So what am I doing in that regular expression that requires that much code? Well, what I'm doing is I'm parsing the entire Perl document but in doing so, I'm maintaining a stack of scope descriptors into which I assign information about each of the variables that are declared or used in each scope that I encounter within the document. And what they look like are just little pieces of code to be executed as I'm doing my parsing. So to push a scope, all I do is create a new hash that represents the new scope and then push it onto this stack that I'm maintaining in a package variable. And I'm using a package variable here because lexical variables in Perl don't always play nicely inside regular expressions. So what's going to go into that description of the new scope? Well, for a start, I'm going to copy from the previous scope 
all of the IDs and make them the IDs of this scope, because that's the way lexical scoping works. When you go into a lexical scope, you get a copy of all the existing variables from that outer scope. And I'm also going to provide the possibility that there are going to be new declarations in this scope. So I'm going to have a slot whereby I can install these new declarations, but of course initially there won't be any of them. And then when I get to the end of any particular scope, I'm obviously just going to pop the stack to take me back to the previous level. I'm going to record where I was in the actual source code, my position in the source code string, so that I know where the end of scope is for each scope. And then for each of the variables that were in this old scope that I just popped, I'm going to make their end of scope be the current end of scope. So as I come out of a scope, I'm going to track in each variable that was declared in it that this was the end of that variable's scope. And then the rest of the subroutine is all about parsing the various components of a Perl program while tracking the declaration and use of variables in the various scopes where they may appear. The first thing that I actually do is not related to scope. It's about finding which version of Perl this code thinks it is. So I need to parse any use statement that I encountered, and in particular, any use version statement, and save that information as the version that we're going to use for the whole thing. And this is the way that the module knows how to build subroutines. Does it build them the new way or does it build them the old way? How do I refactor closures, the new way or the old way? It's all based on which version of Perl you've said that this code requires. So I store that away whenever I encounter a used version. But mostly what I'm going to be doing is parsing a series of blocks of code. And every time I parse a block of code, I'm going to push a new scope onto the stack, then parse the block of code in the exact standard way that it would be parsed any other time. And then having done that, I'm going to pop that new stack frame off as I'm done with it. But in addition, I have to cater for the possibility that I won't successfully parse a block at this point. It might turn out to be an anonymous hash instead. So I need to make sure that I keep the stack consistent. So if I fail to parse that block, I have to make sure I revert the stack on that failure. Because I'm always going to push it onto the stack, but if I fail to parse the block, then this pop stack is not going to operate at all. So I need something that pops the stack for me in that failure case. And of course, I need the same thing for any location where I might encounter variables. So if I'm inside an anonymous hash, then I need to add a scope around that and take the scope off afterwards. Now, earlier I mentioned that variables in Perl are unusual in that they don't come into existence when they're declared. They come into existence at the end of the statement where they were declared. So that means that I need to be a bit careful when I'm parsing Perl statements. I still need to parse the statement in exactly the normal way, but after I finished parsing the statement is the point where I should install any new declarations that occurred in that statement into the current scope. They shouldn't be installed as soon as they're encountered. They should only be installed after the statement is complete. And of course, once again, if I fail, to parse a statement for some reason, then I need to be sure that I'm clearing out those declarations that may be partial but not complete. And what does it look like to install those declarations? Well, all I do is I go through the list of declarations that have been added to this current scope, and for each of them I install their ID as the ID for this variable, named whatever it's been named. And then I take all the other information that I got about it, its declarator, its sigil, its name, its description, and I store them in a table that I'm building up of variable information about these various components. And finally, I add to my other table, which is where were the various variables used, the information that this variable has not been used anywhere yet. Eventually I'll populate this hash, but at the moment it hasn't been used anywhere. 
And having installed all those declarations, which I found in the previous statement, then I reset the list of declarations to nothing, because I don't want to install them a second time, they've already been dealt with. And likewise, if I'm clearing a pending declaration, then I'm not going to do any of that installation, I'm simply going to clear them out because apparently they weren't correct. And then for any kind of construct that has the potential for declaring or using variables, I need to track those variables in that construct using the similar sort of technique. The block is the simplest example, but control blocks are a little bit more syntactically sophisticated. So once again, I'm going to always push a new scope on any time I'm considering some kind of control block. And then I'm going to parse the keyword, in this case, if or unless, but I'm not going to install the declarations that might occur inside the parenthesis list. So the parenthesis list might have declarations, but it might also refer to variables that are from the outer scope. Remember, the declarations that might occur in the parenthesis list don't actually come into effect until we get to the block. So we parse that parenthesis list as if it were in the outer scope, and then we install the declarations just before we go into the block. We go into the block, match the block, and then we pop the scope that we pushed at the very beginning of the process. And of course, having done that successfully for an if, there might also be an else if, which will require exactly the same sequence of operations. Same thing for a for loop. If we have a for loop, then immediately after the for loop's keyword, we have to allow for declarations, because that's the syntax. You say for, you say the name of the iterator. And the name of that iterator might have a, an explicit declarator on it, or it might be implicitly declared. But in either case, we need to record it as the declaration of a variable. So once we've been through that part of the code, we can then say, OK, I'm going to record the fact that I had this declaration in that point, and I'm going to stop allowing declarations at that point, because I'm not yet in its actual scope. So I have this subroutine that just says, OK, I can turn on and off declarations by setting a flag in the current scope, or I can, at the end of those declarations, I can record the fact that I had a declaration without actually installing it. So I'm going to say, for each declaration that has been found in the current scope, unpack all the information about it and record that information, but don't yet put it into the stack frame. And the reason I can't yet put it into the stack frame is that in a for loop, or any other kind of loop, I still have the parenthesis list to follow. And that parenthesis list, as we saw earlier, isn't in the scope of the iterator variable. So I have to parse that as if it were in the outer scope before I try and install any variables. And the same thing is true for a while or an until. As soon as you've seen the keyword, then you can have declarations in the parenthesis list, but you want to record those declarations and not install them until the parenthesis list is finished. And then for either kind of loop, once we've finished going through the parentheses, then and only then we can install those declarations before parsing the block. It's very similar for subroutine declarations. We push a scope around it, we parse the keywords, which can sometimes not have the keyword sub in front of them, and then we say, okay, after that, we've got a spot where we could have a parameter list, which is an implicit set of declarations. So we allow declarations in that point, we parse the parameter list, we record the declarations, we parse anything else that might be before the block, and then just before the block, we install those declarations, parse the block again, and then pop the scope. Or if we fail at some point, we revert the scope to keep the stack consistent. Same for anonymous subroutines. For variable declarations, we match the declarator. At that point, we're allowed to have a declaration. So we look for some kind of Perl L value. And we can't just put a variable at this point 
because a variable declaration can sometimes have parentheses around it. It's quite complicated. But once we've found all the variables that are being declared by this declarator, we record them and then disallow the declarations. And what does that L value look like? Well, it's the thing that's actually finally going to start saving variables for us. So it might just be a sigil followed by an identifier, or it might be a list of comma-separated sigils followed by identifiers. And however I find the variable, I then save that variable. And likewise, for simple R value uses of it, for, for uses of a scalar or an array or a hash, I just parse it in the standard sort of way and then save the variable into the current stack frame for the scope. And what does that mean? Well, when I'm saving a variable, I have to put it in one of two places. If it's the declaration of the variable, I need it in one place. If it's a use of the variable, I need it somewhere else. So the first thing we do is we extract the information, namely the name and the location of the variable that we just parsed correctly. And if we are in a context that allows declarations, then we take that information and shove it straight into the list of declarations for the bottom stack frame of the scope. On the other hand, if we're not somewhere that allows declarations, then this must just be a simple usage of the variable. So we have quite a lot of code here that normalizes the variable back to its name because the variable might be an array lookup or a hash lookup, and it might have a dollar sign sigil instead of its true sigil of at sign or percentage. So we need to uh, normalize it back to that standard format before we record its usage within this scope at this location. So once we've gone through and saved every variable, then we can install the declarations that we have encountered into each scope, maintaining the scope by pushing and popping all the way up and down. And then everything else that parses the Perl code here is provided by PPR Grammar. It does all of the hard work for us. It's another 2,000 lines of regex doing that work for us. And once we have that long, complicated regular expression that is able to track the declaration and use of variables for us, then writing the actual subroutine that classifies variables for us really is quite simple. We set up the stack and the various tables as localized pa package variables. We then parse the source code with that regex, and you'll notice that I've used the O flag here for one of the very few times in my Perl career. I found that here the O flag actually causes the regex to run about 400% faster, so it was definitely worth doing. And having parsed the source code and extracted all that information into those tables, then we can go through the table and for each variable that we encountered, we can augment it with extra information. So we can check whether it's one of the built-in Perl variables and add in description and aliases for those variables. We can find out whether it's one of these bad words, because I've written a pattern that does that, and if it is, we can mark it as being an inappropriate name for something. And then we can go through and look for all the variables that have either exactly the same name or a very similar name and record those as well. And finally, we can get some sense of how large the scope is, so I can color code my scope bars, simply by saying, well, subtract the place where it's declared from the place where it goes out of scope and divide that by the total length of the source. And then we get a value between zero and one that indicates how much of the source code is this variable in scope for. And having taken all that information, I then just return it in one big hash. And that big hash really is a very big hash because there are a lot of variables and each of them has a lot of information. So if we zoom in and have a look at that information, the first thing we see is, yes, it's telling me, ah, this code claimed that it required version 530, so I can use that later on to choose the right way to implement refactoring. 
but the vast majority of this data structure is just a table of all the variables that were encountered in the source code. Each of them is indexed by their position in the source code, and each of them provides all of that information that I managed to extract or analyze within the regex or within the subroutine. So for example, all the information about the name and description of the variable, information about what kind of variable it is and what scope it exists in, the analysis information, does it have a bad name, is it built in, and of course, a complete list of every location where the variable is used. And then the rest of the module uses all of that information extracted by that one subroutine to implement the lexical hoisting of expressions or the refactoring into subroutines or closures or the code quality analysis or simply to track individual variables when you put the cursor over them. So that's the code art module. It's available now on CPAN. And even if you never want to use Vim to edit Perl, it's worth having a look at the source code of that to see how it does this thing. Now, I'm not saying that it's perfect. In fact, it's still pretty much alpha. There's still a lot of things that I want to add to it. The refactoring that it does is fairly smart, but it could be smarter. It doesn't, for example, understand the scoping of dollar underscore properly, and I need to get it to do that right. I also wanted to understand the scoping of subroutines, not just lexical subroutines, but package subroutines as well. And I need to understand that scoping because I want to be able to rename subroutines just as easily in their lexical or package scope. And I want to be able to do the opposite of refactoring in that I want to be able to take a subroutine call and inline the actual subroutine code in place of that call. I also want to be able to say, OK, here's a subroutine. I want to add a parameter to it or remove a parameter from it or just change the name or the order of one or more parameters. And I'd like that then to be able to go through the rest of the code and find all the calls and rearrange their argument lists in the same kind of way. And I want all of those features integrated right into Vim. And not just for Perl. I'd also like to be able to do that for Raku code that I'm editing in Vim. And I think writing the Raku version of code art is going to be a really interesting exercise. I think it's going to be at least three times harder because Raku as a language is at least three times bigger than Perl. But I also think it's probably going to be about three times easier than writing code art for Perl was, simply because Raku has proper grammars. I'm not going to have to write large regular expressions with weird kind of uh, callouts in them to interrupt the parsing of the whole document and do something with it. I can just pass a Raku document directly to a grammar and have it return a data structure that represents the entire scope and usage of variables. And the reason I can do that is that Raku already has one grammar built into it, and that's its own grammar, the Raku grammar. So I can just hook straight into that and immediately get back an entire parse tree for any source code that I send it. And finally, the reason I think it's going to be easier is, frankly, Raku's grammar is quite a bit saner than the Perl grammar and quite a bit more regular. So it's going to be easier to walk through that parse tree and detect the various components that I want to rename or refactor or even just highlight. So I'm really looking forward to building the Raku version of this module. Because after all, how hard could it be? And we're back live. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that, or at least survived that. Uh, and uh, uh, are there any questions? 
Uh, someone's uh, going to have to marshal thought, the questions for me. Todd, could you possibly do that for me? Sure. Uh, I, I think I'm going to start with uh, the audience would like to thank Ovid for causing all of this to happen. Um, I think uh, I, I need to change some settings. Hold on one second. Okay. Okay. I'm going to allow you guys to unmute yourself, but we're still going to go with raise hands. And I think the first question. Oh, yes, there we go. <laughs> Break out the Sounds Agnew. Sounds really weird over my low frequency uh, uh, link. But thank you. I appreciate your appreciation. Uh, so I think the first question is from Santiago. Yeah. Uh, so I was. I was writing this on the chat. Um, I wonder what is the performance impact of all of this uh, on a model that is say 100 or 1,000 of line, lines long. Uh, okay. Since I'm not so versed with beams on how extensions work, I guess it parses the whole document and then otherwise how, how can you voice the values and stuff? Yeah, it absolutely has to parse the whole document in every case. Uh, because it needs to know which variables are in and out of scope. But more, more than just that, it also needs to know the context of what you're actually refactoring. A lot of the smartness that it has in refactoring is it looks ahead and looks behind so that it can see uh, what context you're doing this in. For example, if you um, have a, a series of map, grep, map, sort, etc. Uh, in a functional style of Perl coding. If you pull the middle bit out, it'll refactor it in such a way that it still passes the remaining arguments in as well. So it's got to pass the whole document every time. Um, that's why I'm working on making it as asynchronous as possible. Um, for code that's hundreds of lines long, it's still perfectly fine. For code that's thousands of lines long, it starts getting a little bit slow. Um, so I, I want to improve that. And just this morning, I, I got up early, so I'd be ready for the talk, and I had an idea and started recoding the uh, module already uh, so that more of it becomes uh, asynchronous. One of the things you might have noticed is there's a slight delay when you put the cursor onto a variable before, in fact, it highlights that variable and gives you all the information about it. Now, part of that delay is just me not wanting uh, Vim to be constantly sending off these Perl requests, so I deliberately delay it a little bit. But what I'd like to be able to do is to hook into the analytics that it does for all the other stuff, like the homograms and the cacograms and the paragrams. And because I've already got the information about all the variables in that information that's coming back for the overall analysis. So this morning I changed it so that now, as soon as you go on to a variable, it immediately just looks up the information that it already has and returns that at once. So that's going to solve some of the problem. The only time now that it's going to have to re-evaluate, uh, re-parse and restructure is when you actually change the code. Uh, so I think that's going to deal with a lot of the problems. The other issue here is that it very much depends on which version of Perl you're running under. And sadly, the more recent the version of Perl, the slower the regex engine actually runs. So um, the uh, when I run this under Perl 5.16 and Perl 5.18, then um, the timing test that I do, um, th there are quite a few of them, take about four seconds. Uh, when I run it under 5.22 and later, they take about 20 seconds. So it's going to depend on which version of Perl you're using to actually do this. Um, but everything I've been working on here has been trying to make this faster. And surprisingly, because it's really just doing a single regex match followed by a little bit of processing, it's not as slow as you might expect, except when the source code gets extremely large. Uh, so I, I'm using it uh, in uh, real code in my other modules. I'm using it for highlighting and for analysis and so forth. 
And in most cases, I find it fairly reasonable. The one that it doesn't work very well for, well, there are two. The first one it doesn't work very well for is the code art module, um, because every time you change the source code, it breaks the entire system. And the other one it doesn't work very well for is PPR, because PPR is itself just one huge regular expression. So there's a kind of a recursive problem there, but as long as you're not editing those two, it's going to be reasonable. This talk, this question and answer session is going to go like forever because whenever I answer a question, it's another talk. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Ovid? Oh, let me. <clears throat> okay. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Okay. So, <clears throat> first of all, I want to apologize to everyone for the butterfly effect of me asking a simple question and. Damien providing a complete answer. Um, so that's a little bit awkward there. Um, this might be jumping the gun. I'm not sure um, because I don't know if this was discussed, but uh, one of the things that Sorry was working on was uh, use Perl standard, which is not something that is intended to be enforced upon anyone, but it is a, a small subset of the Perl language, which is mostly what everyone does. There's nothing unusual about it. It just removes a few tiny things, uh, the big one being here docs, that if you remove those things that you have a subset of Perl that is almost entirely everything that we use with Perl, uh, but can be parsed with BNF grammar. And as a result, the work that Damien does could be applied to Pro 5 today in a much more performant manner, in a much more interesting manner that gives us power that we have never had today. So a lot of what he's working around today is the fact that the Pro grammar is fairly freewheeling and it's very difficult to deal with. But if use feature standard um, gets adopted more widely, um, it's not that it takes this, anything away from you because you don't have to uh, follow that, but the documentation for Perl will follow those standard features. It will follow features that follow uh, a BNF grammar that is very easy to understand, very easy to parse, very easy for a human to read and understand, and it will make it much, much easier and faster for Damien's work to be applied um, in editor tools that we have today which means it's not just Vim, it's also Emacs. It's also, you know, um, I still remember one of my one of my bosses when I worked for cooking.com was using, oh, what's that uh, editor for Java that's used all the time? I'm, I'm struggling to remember the name, and I can't remember it now. But basically, uh, it was dog slow when he, whenever he wanted to try anything because of the difficulty of parsing for Um So I... First of all, Damien, holy shit! What you did was amazing. But if people are willing to accept uh, a few minor modifications of the Pro language, it will make it tremendously easy to do what you've done. And so all of us will have an easier way of bringing this on board. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, well, um, uh, I reviewed uh, um, Sawyer's guacamole talk uh, this morning when I got up. I didn't watch it live because it was on at like 4 a.m. for me and that's just too early. Um, it's awesome work there too. Uh, I'm sure that uh, because the parser is MARPA based, it's going to be much faster. And I agree, if you are willing to work within the limitations and if you can, if you have a code base that isn't littered with tens of thousands of lines of Perl code that has features that standard Perl just won't parse, then yeah, absolutely. And I, it would be great to look at, can we hook uh, some of that parsing technology into this to handle those cases? And, and presumably we could, because it could first try to parse it using the standard Perl parser. And if that fails, it could just fall back on the full Perl parser. So then you might get the best of both worlds. But my view was um, I've got a lot of old code. A lot of people have got a lot of old code. And that old code has things that standard Perl will never and should never handle. 
and yet why should those people be uh, disenfranchised from using these kinds of tools? And, you know, I write these things predominantly for myself and my code goes back two decades and it's got a lot of stuff that I'm never going to port it to a standard Perl implementation. So I want it to be possible everywhere. And I, I actually don't think the performance is too terrible at the moment. One of the, the um, next things that I've got on my list is to change PPR so that it doesn't just parse full Perl, but it also returns a proper syntax tree. Um, so kind of cross it with my regex grammars module uh, so that you get back a, a very much a, a guacamole-like uh, abstract syntax tree with proper node, uh, notations on every node uh, and with good detail, which you don't always get from PPI, but which still runs reasonably fast because it's mostly regex based. And, you've basically today seen the approach that I'll be taking with that, that um, if I'm going to uh, make PPR able to return a syntax tree, then I'm going to have to retain, maintain a stack uh, that I build the syntax tree out of. And the techniques that I've shown uh, in today's keynote would be the techniques that I would use for that as well. Now, it'll never be as fast as a MARPA-based one. Um, but on the other hand, if you do have any here docs, uh, it handles them correctly. Okay, uh, next up is Carl. Hi, a couple, couple things. Um, it would be good if you could bisect that slowdown in later pearls to see what series of commits uh, caused this. That would be helpful so we could uh, try to fix it. Also, the other thing about performance was we changed the uh, behavior of the, the O modifier at some point in the 20 series so that it should be irrelevant to later pearls. So, sure, but I'm I'm trying to support Perl 16 onwards. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure that that 400% slowdown wasn't in really modern Perls, that we actually had fixed that or that you had found a bug. Okay, so uh, I mean, that's an interesting, uh, that's something I hadn't considered, but it's interesting that um, at the, the kind of 518, 520 disconnect, which is where the most of the changes started coming into the regex engine as i understand it that's where this slows down so maybe that o flag is not helping those later versions but i, I think that there are other issues um, with the later versions of the regex engine uh, in particular the fact that they now correctly handle lexical scoping and I think that injected some slowdown as well. And I'd certainly be interested in someone bisecting the performance of those things. Um, but I have an extremely strict rule, which is I never get involved in the implementation. And that's not just for my benefit, that's for the benefit of the entire Perl community. Um, so if someone wants uh, me to send examples of regexes that run four or five times slower i'm very happy to do that but i'm not prepared to do the uh the you know uh, uh, abdominal surgery so uh, send them to on me. pearl itself send them to me khw at cpan okay can i i'm not going to be able to remember that because i'm in presentation mode can you just email me at damien at conway.org and we'll get into conversation that way all right great thanks carl okay next up is andrew Hi there. Uh, two quick ones. Um, what was the length where you're like, oh, if it's so long, it gets kind of unbearably slow. I'm sure it's longer than anything I'm typing. And two, uh, how much did you actually have to do on the Vim side or is it mostly just handled? Uh, I mean, for this highlighting part, obviously you have your um, hooks for the restructuring. But, okay. So, um... It's not so much the length of the code that the critical issue, it's the complexity of it, the lexical complexity of it. 
uh, and the sheer number of variables that it uses and uh, does it do the things that PPR takes a while to parse. But on anything up to about a thousand lines, I'm not noticing significant slowdowns. Uh, above about a thousand lines, it seems to get a bit hard. The second question, how much is going on on the VIM side? Well, there's a whole other talk on what's going on on the VIM side, um, but that wouldn't be an appropriate talk for at least half of this audience. So I didn't delve into any more than that just brief touch that I have. The plugin itself is, um, it's pretty long for a, a VIM plugin and it's fairly complicated too, because I want the API to be very clean. I didn't, I showed you what I could do in VIM, but I didn't show you how easy the API made it. And my goal was it should be easier to do this in VIM than it is to currently do it in comma for Raku. And I think in most cases I seem to have achieved that, but that did require quite a bit of VIM scripting. Uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, what, how many lines of code the, um, uh, just a second. Uh, yeah, the, the, the VIM plugin is only 734 lines long. So it's, it's not all that complicated. And actually I'll sneak one more in, um, locals. Um, and where you relocalize something before you go somewhere else, uh, handled, not handled. Or uh, it pauses it correctly, but it doesn't um, highlight those any differently because a localized version of the variable is technically still the same variable. And I, I must admit, I went back and forth on that. Should I, in fact, represent them as being different or should I represent them as being the same? And I could argue it either way. And if people have an opinion on that, I'm very happy to get feedback on it. It, it doesn't do that at the moment. It would be fairly trivial to do so because it's just another kind of declarator. So at the point where I saw that declaration, I would just insert another declaration. Um, it's probably a five minute change uh, if that's what people think they'd prefer. Um, I don't think about them that way, but other people might. So the feature flags. All right. Yeah. Okay, one last question. David, uh, did you want to ask or you want me to ask? Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you've tested this in Perl, or I mean, <laughs> tested this <laughs> in Eclipse. Uh, sorry, what do you mean tested this in Eclipse? Uh, I, part of your um, talk in, involved how to use it with other editors. Um, and I just wondered if you've actually tried using it in Eclipse. No, I have not plugged it into any other editor. I am frankly not interested in plugging it into any other editor myself. Um, the low level tools that the module provides, I believe will make it easy to do that because it made it easy to do it for Vim. But I have literally zero interest in using Eclipse or VS Code uh, for anything other than demonstrating how much better Vim is than Eclipse or VS Code. Okay, and I think that's the last question. Damien, thank you so much for, for this content or for this talk, and thank you so much for joining us in the Q&A. We really appreciate it. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, thanks everyone for sitting through that uh, grueling one hour marathon. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference, stay safe, stay well, um, wear a mask. Excellent.